It's the Brian Lehrer Show on WNYC. Good morning again, everyone. Now we continue our WNYC Centennial Series, 100 Years of 100 Things, looking at the history and possible future of 100 different people and topics as WNYC celebrates our 100th birthday. We hope it's a fitting birthday observance. We hope you've been enjoying the series, consistent with our mission of deepening knowledge and thoughtfulness these last 100 years, 100 Years of 100 Things. Thing number 31 today, relevant to the election year, A hundred years of black Americans struggle for voting rights and who they voted for for president. With the Democrats worried that more black men than in the past might vote for Donald Trump, former President Obama, in a recent appearance, spoke directly to black men who are considering that choice. And so now you're thinking about sitting out or even supporting somebody who has a history of denigrating you because you think that's a a sign of strength because that's what being a man is putting women down that's not acceptable Former President Obama speaking in Pittsburgh last week. We'll come back to the choices facing black voters, including black men, today. But let's look back at history. After the Civil War and the end of slavery, the 15th Amendment to the Constitution ratified in 1870 said the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Of course, the 15th Amendment only applied to men at the time. And, of course, beyond that, we know that the 15th Amendment didn't end racial barriers to being able to vote in practice, only on paper. As the National Archives webpage puts it, African Americans were still denied the right to vote by state constitutions and laws, poll taxes, literacy tests, the so-called grandfather clause, and outright intimidation, unquote. It took until the 24th Amendment, by the way, in 1964, for poll taxes to be banned, and, of course, the Voting Rights Act of 65 for more than that. As for who black Americans have chosen for president, those who could vote have gone majority for the Democrats since FDR's first re-election in 1936, largely for Republicans before that. Uh, But Democrats from 36 and beyond by varying margins, which we'll get into, and with a few points either way, mattering in close elections like the last two and presumably this year, maybe 100 years of history can shed some light on what people are grappling with right now. With us now, we are so happy to have Daryl Pinckney, author of many works of fiction, nonfiction, and theater, including his book, Blackballed, The Black Vote, and U.S. Democracy. Mr. Pinckney, so nice of you to give us some time for this. Welcome to WNYC. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Lair, but uh, do call me Daryl. And call me Brian. Can we start at that point more than 150 years ago now, the 15th Amendment? Any thoughts on what it did do and what it didn't do? Well, um, I think that uh, uh, it um, sets a precedent um, that has been very important, which is the uh, legal uh, mechanism by which we um, make inclusiveness or expanding the reach of the rights uh, embedded in the Constitution, um, you know, sort of one after the other. And so democracy turns out to be an additive process. Um, if that makes any sense. Yeah. You know, that just join us, join us, join us. And I find on the other side, the conservative opposition to expansion of democracy has never changed, not since the founding uh, conventions. It's always been the same, uh, which is this anxiety about democracy itself. A um, hundred years ago, 1924, the technical starting point of these segments. Jim Crow was in full force in the South, of course. The Klan was in its second heyday. 
and more. I see you were born in the early 1950s, and you grew up in Indianapolis, if what I read is accurate. It was the civil rights movement era, but you were in the North. What was Northern segregation, unofficial segregation, like in your early life? I know you wrote about this in the book. You write about um, that, and, and, and did it apply to voting? Um, in my early childhood, when I think back, the places where we went for recreation were segregated, but I didn't think of them in that way because they were full of friends and uh, my parents' friends. Um, um, because my parents were um, rank and file active uh, in the NAACP, um, the civil rights movement was always, you know, just sort of there, um, like having to go to church or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, Indiana is a very conservative state. Nevertheless, I think that um, uh, people felt rather emboldened um, because they were connected to something larger than one state. Um, I think the, it's important to remember that the outcome of those times was far from certain. Nobody knew how any of it would turn out. So those people who did take a stand or tried to do what they could you know, should be remembered and thanked uh, because it all came at some risk to themselves. And that includes politicians who sponsored unpopular legislation. Uh, so, um, but of course, uh, the history of Brown versus Board of Education tells us that um, opposition to this expansion of democracy, this definition of inclusiveness has never ceased. Uh, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, what we have now is something we've never had before or haven't had in a hundred years, which is a kind of white nationalism um, that f I think is still this kind of long reaction to Obama in some way. The timeline I've seen of the percentage of black Americans votes for president shows a majority for the Republican candidates until uh, 1932 or through 1932. Of course, Lincoln was a Republican and that um, set a standard and the Southern Democrats were ardent segregationists. But it flipped for good in 1936, FDR's first re-election, but that was still in the Jim Crow era. Do you have a take on why black Americans shifted then to the Democratic presidential ticket? Well, I think that uh, one, uh, the sort of chances to vote um, meant that they were, yeah, um, engaged. Um, and it took a long time for the popular resentment of the Democrats in the South to change. Um, that really wasn't until sort of Kennedy and Johnson, um, because the, the Dixiecrats, the Democrats, you know, um, their, their heritage was this opposition to Reconstruction, and uh, which was a Republican Party, Lincoln, um, social experiment. Um, I think that uh, didn't entirely sort of uh, flip. Uh, remember, Martin Luther King Sr. was Republican, uh, and so was Condoleezza Rice's parents. So were Condoleezza Rice's parents, and I think Angela Davis's parents as mm. well. I'm not sure. Uh, so, you know, again, they're in the South, and they, you know, they have these family allegiances already. Uh, Lena Horne's family, I think, was very Republican. So it, it was a kind of middle class um, position. Um, that wasn't sort of easily given up. It came with this generation that, and it's not that blacks got um, as much or anything from the New Deal, New Deal down south that they should have. Um, Roosevelt was only able to pass a lot of it by promising the south that blacks would be excluded or certain black professions like domestic labor or agricultural workers would be excluded from uh, relief provisions. 
Um, I think it had more to do with, again, this sense of belonging to something larger. Uh, and it was still a time of migration um, and going sort of back and forth. Um, and it's very striking to me that Langston Hughes got it so wrong in 1935, thinking that the country was going to the left when that wasn't the case at all. Um, but something else was sort of taking shape um, in spite of that, uh, which had to do with, I think, um, generational change in Black America itself. And that generation that was about to enter college was also the generation of World War II. So that had, I think, more to do with it than anything. Do you think the country wasn't going to the left in 1935? That was the New Deal era. All these, you know, uh, policies that I think are widely considered social democracy that hadn't existed before, that the right has been fighting ever since. Um, so in that respect, or did you mean something, did Langston Hughes mean something else by that? I think he meant sort of going to the left, but of course he ended up, you know, sort of dodging um, the McCarthy committee or, you know, trying to um, get out of trouble with it, like sort of many. So I think I, I meant it in that way that, you know, he thought because so much was happening in the way of social experiment and social acceptance that uh, things were going in this, what he saw as progressive way. But it didn't end up that, it didn't end up like that for lots of different reasons. Listeners, it's 100 years of Black American struggle for voting rights and who you have voted for in our 100 Years of 100 Things series. And as we do in these segments, we'd love to hear some oral history from some of you, 212-433-WNYC, who has an old memory or maybe had a story passed down in your black family about how your parents or grandparents or great-great-grandparents voted for president, or you yourself, black Democrats, black Republicans, anyone who's gone back and forth. You can also talk about your family's historical feelings about voting itself, given the barriers to that in U.S. history, or your activism or their activism. Our guest, Daryl Pinckney, was talking a minute ago about the feeling of community that being part of that movement engendered in the 1950s as an example that went beyond place, whether you were in Indianapolis where he was growing up or somewhere else. 212 Four three three, who has a story? Go as far back as you can in our hundred year timeline. Two one two four three three nine six nine two, or bring it back to the present with Daryl Pinckney in the context of uh, him as the author of Blackballed, the Black Vote and U.S. Democracy. Two one two four three three nine six nine two. Call or text. Did Did you want to correct something I said? You're jumping in there. No, not at all. I was just already. Sort of. I hope what I said made sense. But at the moment, suddenly I'm thinking of one of these demonstrators in Hong Kong uh, a few years ago at the end of the pandemic or just before George Floyd saying we must act out our democracy. And when I think of my great great grandfather and after in reconstruction, they went to the polls in armed groups. Uh, and in those days, the ballots boxes themselves were segregated. Um, my parents when uh, I had to vote, when we sort of moved out of the city um, in, a, in a country club that not even Jewish people could join, uh, that would just happened to be across the street. I found this very funny. My parents didn't weren't amused at all. Um, but when more blacks moved to the neighborhood, the poles got moved to the fire station because mm. uh, that was just sort of too many, too many people not liking this irony. Um, so, well, yeah. Go ahead. No, I think you made the point. voting is not a passive activity. Looking at the timeline of black Americans votes for president, uh, the percentages I'm seeing are 70 percent for Roosevelt in 1936, the first time he got a black majority. And a few points more or less than that for many elections afterward in the 70s dropping to 60% Democrat in President Eisenhower's re-election in 1956 as a low point. 
but then soaring to more than 90 percent in the very next election. That was for JFK in 1960. Um just one one thought about Eisenhower. Did he get 40 percent of the black vote, that relatively large minority, reflect his sending the National Guard to desegregate the schools in Little Rock in 1954? Do you think there was a any kind of a one-to-one? Yes. One? yes, I think so. And the Army had by this time been desegregated officially, thanks to Truman, not Eisenhower, who mm -hmm. actually wasn't very progressive in that matter. Um, but yes, I think it had everything to do with Little Rock. And why such a strong affinity for JFK in 1960? More than a 30-point jump in the black vote from the previous election. And, you know, it ha and it's been in the 80 to 90 percent range ever since. I think because they uh, projected this sort of future for America that was, you know, rather sort of young and you know, uh, the new frontier, the new world, um, uh, a departure from the old, regardless of what his policy was specifically and on the ground and how late it took him to say this or that. I think that um, um, people were very ready for a change uh, and for something better. Uh, and they they represented uh, the the. the uh, the Kennedy, um, yes, Kennedy and mm -hmm. and Jackie represented this kind of elevation of uh, uh, American ambition. You know, we were this was a young new voice coming. Um, I think people are as desperate to turn the page now. Gregory in Harlem has a memory of his grandfather voting for Eisenhower. Gregory, you're on WNYC. Thanks for calling today. Hi there, Brian. How are you again? Listen, yeah, my grandfather, World, World War II vet, uh, voted for Eisenhower the first time. And uh, during that tenure, he had changed uh, the Pledge of Allegiance to add under God, I guess under the tutelage of uh, Billy Graham or someone like that. Yeah. And... Um, and and all of a sudden, our money got in God we trust on it um, that same year. And my grandfather said, well, I'm never voting for a Republican again in my life. And, <laughs> you know, we've been Democrats ever since. So that's just a memory of, of uh, I, could, I, I guess he was another one of the black men who uh, voted for Kennedy. Gregory, thank thank you for that story. Lorette in Flatbush, you're on WNYC. Hi, Lorette. Did I get your name right? Is it Lorette? Maybe Loretta? Uh, hello? Hello, is this Lorette in hello. Flatbush? Oh, this is Lorette in Flatbush, Brian. Long time I didn't speak to you. I'm going to take you up the speaker so you can hear me, but it'll be hard for me to hear you. Just a moment now. Okay. All right. Uh, Are you yeah. here? Oh, yes. And now you're very okay. loud. We'll, we'll monitor yeah. that from here. Yeah, but, go ahead. So you know if I'm 90 years old now, you know I've been out here a long time, right? Uh -huh. So I've seen so. all the presidents, all the elections and everything, but I'm a first-generation American, and my grandfather was able to enjoy his first privilege to vote and he made so much of it with the family, how important it was for us to vote because we were citizens. Uh, that was with my parents, and then later with us, and of course, we are with our children. Now, don't forget, my mother was a, a, a community activist, mm -hmm. and she worked with the Board of Elections. So every time I go to vote, I tell the people there, my mother used to do this work. I was also a community activist, of course, I'm so old now, even though I'm still active, but not as a community activist. But in my building, the people will still come to me with um, their questions. Now, don't forget, Brian, I'm ret a retired teacher, right? Okay. Okay. So in my building, a lot of the tenants are immigrants or children of immigrants, and they still come to me with questions about voting or voting app registration applications to vote, and all of that goes back to the fact that my parents and my grandparents were immigrants, Brian. 
Lorette, thank Are you, you getting all of this? I'm getting all of that. Okay. La- lastly, lastly, Brian, uh-huh. I just want to let you know that I was the first student of color in an all-white school up in Kingston, New York. And during our history lessons about the Constitution and the end of slavery, the way we had to memorize it was the 13th freed them, the 14th made them a citizen, and the 15th made, gave them the right to vote. And that's what prompted me, me to make this call. Lorette, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, any you. quick uh, reflection before we take a break, Daryl, on those first couple of callers? Well, it's very heartening that uh, voting is a kind of living tradition in Black families still. And it hasn't lost its meaning, which is that this is a citizen's um, responsibility and and a duty of pleasure, you know, not just a duty of power, but a duty of pleasure. You know, it's like signing up for the journey. We'll continue in a minute with Daryl Pinckney, more of your oral history calls as well on this 100 Years of 100 Things segment, thing number 31, 100 Years of Black American Struggle for Voting Rights and the History of who people in those communities have voted for for president of the United States. And we're going to bring it up to the present and the current debate and the current issues surrounding many of those voters, including the gender gap that's being widely reported in the polls. 212-433-WNYC, 212-433-9692 for your oral histories or current situation comments. Stay with us. Brian Lehrer on WNYC as we continue for the rest of the hour with our 100 Years of 100 Things segment, number 31, relevant to the election year, 100 Years of Black Americans Struggle for Voting Rights and Who They Voted For, with Daryl Pinckney, author of many works of fiction, nonfiction, and theater, including his book, relevant to this conversation, Blackballed, The Black Vote and U.S. Democracy, and your oral history calls at 212-433-WNYC. Going back to the timeline, Daryl, um, of course, uh, the Voting Rights Act came in 1965. It will turn 60 years old next year. Um, was Lyndon Johnson who was the president then, and a Southerner from Texas. Do you think he was historically a big surprise to many black Americans, um, the way he turned out? Um, I think if you had followed his career, yes. Uh, His uh, uh, election in 64 was such an enormous landslide uh, that, you know, it was understood to be on this kind of wave of change. So the Voting Rights Act, I think he deserves a lot of credit for that he sometimes in the films and histories um, doesn't get enough of for that thing. And, um, you know, Vietnam would be his undoing. Um, um, So his greatest moment was happening just as the thing that would bring him down was beginning to happen as well. After the Voting Rights Act of 65 came the Voter Education Project. Uh, and this is important because they went through the South, this volunteer organization, making Black voters familiar with the process, how to do it, what to expect, um, and just sort of discussions around what it meant uh, uh, to vote. Um, and because you know, still there was a lot of opposition to Black people exercising this right, this carrying out this duty, this proof of citizenship. Um, So I think it's important to remember that voting is a militant act to me. Um, uh, Very soon, you know, it was denounced as a kind of futile working within the system or belief in the system. And it turns out not to be true. I don't like to hear people say it doesn't matter who's in. It most certainly does. Look at the court. Look at the Supreme Court, it certainly mm-hmm. does. Um, I don't like uh, the long kind of leftist view about heightening contradictions or it's all going this way anyway. Um, in the meantime, matters a great deal, especially because the meantime is all I have left at my age. Huh. Um, and then, uh, you know, I don't make apologies for um, my faith in 
um, democracy as, you know, uh, uh, a sensible way to govern. Um, um, history tells us this, and here we are again. Um, and this fascist threat is so real, we almost can't respond to it. Or a lot of people think they'll be fine no matter who's elected. But this isn't true at all. You know, this uh, Trump diminished all of us, you know, not just uh, the State Department. You know, uh, he unleashed this license for corruption that, you know, we've not been able to sort of get rid of. My father used to say that uh, social change brings opportunities, but it also brings opportunists. Um, they're all over the place. At the moment. And, um, you know, I don't really want to hear about black men not voting uh, uh, Democratic or people thinking, well, I vote Democratic, but it doesn't get me anything. None of this is, you know, yeah. Obama, uh, Obama. as urgent at the moment. As Obama vibes not having him in. Yeah. yeah. Obama vibes from you. And we're going to come back to I'm that. I'm sorry. Present. I just keep talking. I hope may I make sense. No, no, but you're I making total. For, you're making for talking too much. I want to hear from callers. Wonderful. Tell me sense. to shut up. We're going to, no, no. But we're going to, we're going to come back in a minute to one more Obama clip on the theme uh, that you were just, just going at and your take on what's actually going on in the electorate today. But let me get another oral history caller in. It's Namat. In Mount Vernon, Matt, you're on WNYC. Hi there. Uh, good morning, Brian. Um, I'm very happy to be back on your show. I love your show. And one of the reasons why I love your show is because of my father, who is an ardent political donkey. <laughs> He's mm -hmm. currently 101 years old. Nice. And I just completed his mail-in ballot, which is the first election that he has not physically gone to the polls. And um, he, you know, is a very ardent Democrat. He came to America in 1944, I believe. And um, so um, I've been raised on, on politics 24 hours a day almost. Um, and he is very terrified of what's going to happen in the election. He feels that we're at a point that America has never seen before. Um, I think that we don't speak enough about how people who are such ardent MAGA um, followers are more following it as a religion than as any kind of persuadable fact. I'm not saying that that's not true of others either, but, and, um, you know, he swears that Johnson is the best president. He's always voted Democratic. In fact, he was a Democratic uh, precinct chair um, when he first, once he first became a citizen and I uh, was knocking doors, uh, going door to door, knocking um, on people's doors and, um, you know, bolstering the Democratic Party in the state of New York just the time he came to this country. Great memories. Thank you for sharing that, Nimat. And I'm sure your father, if he's listening, appreciates it, too. And, you know, the shout out and telling that bit of his story. Um, of course, Daryl, it was the white vote that really changed after the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. I think a majority of white Americans have voted Republican for president ever since, while the black vote remained roughly what it had been. Uh, continuing through the timeline, for example, Bill Clinton got 83 percent of the black vote in 1992. Hillary Clinton, 89 percent when she lost to Trump. Obama, um, spiked it a little more. He got 95% when he was elected in 2008. But Joe Biden, too, got 92% from the stats that I've seen. So um, we played a clip of Obama talking to black men last week about not being fooled into identifying with Trump out of some misplaced notion of what manhood is. We played that earlier in this segment. Here's another short clip. Obama also said this. Because, because part of it makes me think, and I'm speaking to men directly, part of it makes me think that, well, you just aren't feeling the idea of having a woman as president. Mm -hmm. And you're coming up with other alternatives and other reasons for that. So, Daryl, what's, what's your take on this apparent gender gap 
in the polls. I'm not sure how big the gender gap was in the black community in previous presidential elections, but when you're getting around 90 percent, that gap is small and at the margins in any case. Do you think this year looks different for any reason? Do you understand it? We're hearing about all these polls. Well, I think that um, it's probably a bit more related to this um, resentment of the establishment, you know, sort of black, uh, I forget what it's called, the, the we, QAnon, that sort of thing. Well, black uh -huh. QAnon is as stupid as white QAnon. Um, and so I think there was this sort of resentment of uh, liberal institutions um, that became a um, bit too sort of easy as a sort of fallback position, a sort of I'm not going to automatically give my vote or my support or, or this kind of thing. But I think there's also a class of, uh, uh, of younger uh, black men who see themselves as uh, belonging to the entrepreneurial generation. And so they want to identify with, um, you know, these kind of uh, um, extremely wealthy supporters of uh, Republican, of the Republican Party. Um, I think there's a bit of that. I don't think that the gender gap or the ambition gap or anything like that will have a, a sort of meaningful effect um, simply because, um, well, not simply, but uh, because it's not just that the black vote is a, a block vote, it's where it's a block vote uh, and and what place is it wins for the Democratic Party. Um, I think that's a, a sort of the issue. And also, I think that um, the highest voting group in the United States um, are black women. Um, they vote sort of more than any other group, including sort of any white group. Um, as a percentage know, of their population. Ever, yes. As a percentage of the sort of, given their percentage of the population, yes. That's what I mean. Um, so, and I also think that, um, again, there's this desire to kind of turn the page. And so for once, maybe the young will show up regard, in spite of what's happening uh, in, in the global uh sense. I think that, if anything, it would sort of drive people not to vote Republican. Um, if you think of climate change and, and world poverty and uh, sort of the wars going on, I don't see how you could vote Republican. You may not be happy voting um, Democratic. Right. I'm sorry not to have seen more emphasis uh, on the local elections. I don't know how it was, uh, how it's been in other states. But that used to decide a lot of voters and, and bring them out. And so the, the loss of this local sense, I think, is rather large. And then I don't believe in polls anymore. I think people lie to pollsters. And um, you know, there's a rather sort of mm -hmm. sophisticated sense of grievance everyone has. Um, that um, I'm not on social media, so I don't want to sit and condemn or what I'm sort of not a part of, but there is this, maybe this comes to that, the only authority that's unquestioned is that of the victim. And so a lot of people are marching around with grievance because this is their sort of, gives them the right to speak or the power to speak. And I think that's all so wrong. So let um, me play one more clip in our last minute sure. and get a quick reaction from you of Kamala Harris yesterday in her appearance with Charlemagne, uh, the radio and TV host, will hear his question and the start of her answer. I had a politician tell me once that if you're running for a national election, it's bad electoral strategy to say you are going to do things specifically for black people, which is why a lot of politicians mm -hmm. don't speak directly to their plans for black people. Is, is that a thing? I don't I don't know that that's true. I think that what is true is that I am running to be president for everybody. Mm -hmm. But I am clear eyed about the, the, the history and the disparities that exist for specific communities. And I'm not going to shy away from that. It doesn't mean that my policies aren't going to benefit everybody because they are. 
We have exactly 20 seconds for your take on Harris downplaying race and racial equality issues as much as she has. I think that was consistent with the way she's been campaigning. Yes, and Obama campaigned that way also. You just have to look at them to sort of know who they are. So they have to kind of appeal to as wide an audience as possible. And I don't mind that uh, because I think that really universal principles are the one thing Mm. we can stand on and trust. And we will see how that turns out in the end with black turnout and everybody else. That's 100 Years of 100 Things, number 31, 100 Years of Black Americans Struggle for Voting Rights and Who They Voted For for President with Daryl Pinckney in the context of his book, Black Ball, The Black Vote and U.S. Democracy. This is wonderful. Thank you so much.